All right, guys. So uh, we've got Chris Thorndike in the house today from Factory Forge. Um, he's in the office, or he's been in the office the last, I guess today's the second day, discussing um, what our partnership looks like, um, how we can help each other in a way that's mutually beneficial. Um, I'm going to have Chris just kind of um, introduce himself, give a little bit of background about how you got started into the consulting industry. Um, and then just like we did last time, as you guys have questions, uh, you know, we, we want it to be interactive and, and have people engage. So, you know, throw a hand up and we'll, uh, we'll have a dialogue here. But uh, Chris, you mind? Just uh, introducing yourself. Sure. This kind of feels like I'm going to get roasted here. <laughs> it's like, I didn't really know what I was getting into. They're like, you're going to do a spotlight. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. So thank you all for uh, listening and, and uh, welcoming me here. This is the second time I've actually been here. Uh, two years ago, I was a visitor. And uh, I've been actually a Zen Planner client since 2010. And uh, going strong. So thank you guys. Yeah. Uh, you could say I'm a fan of the software, right? Um, so a little bit on my background and story. Um, I got into fitness to help people and really wanted to connect with them. Uh, I think my first step into fitness was I felt like a sense of family and camaraderie and I kind of longed for that. You know, when you get out of school or college, you kind of miss that sense of connection to people and life hits you and you kind of lose friends and you you don't have that team element and that's what really got me hooked on wanting to start a gym and form that for people that you know were just working professionals and it grew from there um, that was in 2008 would you share with the team what you were doing prior to this yeah I was a student in college um, so I started my gym at 22 years old and uh, I just I knew at 12 years old I wanted to run a gym like I had like a pack with my brother. We were like, he was 14 and I was 12. And like, ever since we got into working out, it was just, it's like a drug. And uh, it just captivated me ever since. And I think it was youth sports that got me hooked on the team element. And I just felt like no matter what I tried, I just was longing for that sense of connection and got into like bodybuilding and super ego driven, right? And I just got bored with that and lonely. and. Uh, wanted that connection to people and that's why I fell back on functional fitness and uh, you know it was CrossFit was kind of the the gateway to that um, 2008 no one really knew what that was and uh, I was the young guy running from dumbbells to treadmill to coming back to someone stealing my station in the student gym and they're like this guy's nuts but it, it was like enough to keep it going and then eventually we're like we got to do something with this passion. And uh, it was one of the reasons why I went to business school. It was one of the reasons why I worked so hard to study business and finance. And I just knew that if I could do this lifelong and continue to love it, I'd want to give back in some way to other people that want to do it. And it was through that was like, man, how do I take what I built as a passion and then how do we do this as a career? How do we make this something that we can employ people um, provide jobs and you know build it because uh, you can't do it alone so that's where kind of that evolution of taking a small company and then uh, being able to provide a career for someone was really rewarding and then I just wanted to be able to replicate that um, across the country and uh, six years ago I got into um, helping a, a consulting company build systems and processes I was innovating and just sharing 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 and it soon turned into more than just a passion and uh, I was like I could really do this as an extension of my business and help more people and fast forward today that's you know really what my whole mission is is to connect with business owners and help them build their dream business and make it a reality um, you guys get to see it on the the servicing side of the platforms and you know an intimate look into their their companies and maybe what you don't see is just the 16 hour days the passion that fuels that and when they go home they're exhausted they're tired they miss their kids and I want to give them that um, and do it in a way where they feel like they can do it for as long as I've been doing it so that's Factory Forge in a nutshell <laughs> Beautiful, yeah. um, 
Thank you, I just wrote that up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, not bad for on the spot, Spotlight, yeah. huh? Beat that, future host. I'm glad it's on camera. Oh, is it? <laughs> um, so, I guess moving forward, just to give you guys some insight um, in what I'm seeing in the market and maybe open your eyes to some of your clients that you're working with. Um, I kind of look at it as a spectrum where functional fitness, or we were calling it batik fitness, um, has kind of a a realm of different experience levels. Some people are brand new to the industry, getting into it, you know, as maybe starting out in one themselves and turning that into a passion and wanting to, you know, say, hey, I've always missed this um, piece of my life and I'm, you know, quitting the day job and going to do this. Like there's that type of person. Then there's the people that have really been hustling and trying to make this thing provide for their family and uh, they need help. And I'm trying to bridge the gap of saying, can I really do this and make this a living? Or, you know, can I grow this into something that I've always dreamed about and it starts providing this lifestyle? Can I take a vacation? Can I, you know, fund my kids college? Can I buy a home? Like, like real things that everybody wants, but in the coaching industry, um, it's a hustle, it's a grind. So we have to mix the passion of starting this and it's fun. And I think maybe around like two years, people can, you know, survive on very little 16 hour days but over time you're like i actually need to build things that take care of my family and, and lifelong so that's what i think we're trying to do collectively together is this software has the ability to um, take my lessons and failures and uh, things that i'm trying to do for them to bridge the gap of the hardships i've had and then can we do it more efficiently together using the software um, so the last, I don't know, 24 hours have been really fun kind of geeking out with these guys and seeing what you have built. Some stuff I didn't even know about that's just, I feel like you've been hanging on to. I just learned about your software for uh, websites and your new service release on the, on the marketing side. I like completely missed that. Uh, <laughs> so that's a major help to these guys out there that, um, really good at serving people and connecting with them on that emotional level and being there for their training side, but maybe don't love marketing and don't love um, all the things that come with figuring out that new skill. And it takes away from being a better mentor, it takes away from being a better coach. So you guys are actually keeping people in their strength zone. Like it's their superpower, it's what they love to do. And the more that they go into the business, and they have to learn marketing and sales and service and admin, you're, it's literally pulling them out of the passion that they started. And it's a real thing. And over time, if we don't solve that together, they're gonna burn out and they're gonna quit and they're gonna say, it's not worth it anymore. So that's ultimately what, on the ground level, I think we're all doing collectively together. And uh, I'm here today to just learn and absorb and just give what I have and hope we can turn it into something really cool. So. That's awesome. Um, on, on a philosophical level, before we dive in deep, the, the difference between sales and retention, if you had to pick one area to focus on, which one would you go for? You're asking the coach at heart, so what do you guys think I'm gonna pick? Retention. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> retention. Yeah. It's, you know, sales is like the sexy thing, I think, of like, oh, we're making money and like it fuels the business. But at the same time, I feel like retention is the love of taking care of your client and serving them and, and the reward, the emotional reward of taking someone from, you know, just starting fitness. And I just got phone with one of my friends this morning and he was talking about how difficult it is for a friend of his to get into fitness. It's like scary, intimidating, uh, anxiety, depression, and like to be able to take someone from that starting place. And we talk about this all the time where like the initial start for someone, like just giving them the tools and empowering them. And then pretty soon their confidence increases. And then like they actually are willing themselves through to this moment where like they actually want to be there it's like the will to want and then once they actually want to be there they're actually enjoying this experience you created for them and then pretty soon it becomes their identity 
it's who they are. Like they're the workout person or they're the healthy person now. And I think that's the ultimate dream that we're trying to take people through and just keep it going, right? Like that's long-term, long-term like preventative care. So. So I don't know how much longer I can ramble. Uh, I'm, I'm searching here, but I'm open to questions and just opening up the dialogue, um, you know, and just getting to know you guys and go from there. Cool. We got one back here. You've mentioned like you've scaled your business and I imagine you help scale other people's businesses as well. Uh, what do you see uh, like what advice do you have for that? Because of, like you have to find somebody that's gonna kind of replicate what you've done or what their what your clients are doing like reliably and consistently rather than making their own thing or failing it, replicating that. Like what what do you look for with that? Yeah, good question. And a lot of what I'm trying to do is prevent mistakes, right? And the hardships that I've been through and I think scale is relative as well. Like everyone has a different variation of a dream of um, being an owner operator or being a fitness owner without too much involvement just because you love the space like I think there's a lot that goes into what does the dream look like um, so it has to start there of um, you know and once that's really architected and designed in a way where we know what that vision is then we can start looking at the actual role like how deep do you want to be on the technical side of delivering the coaching? Do you want to be more of a manager? Or, you know, what is your day to day job role? You know, like what gets you up in the morning? So we go through a spectrum of helping them plan and strategize what that vision is and then how to live that best life within the company that they built. Because often you'll see is like when we start out, we are the business, like we're everything. And then that gets one draining to to be everything in the business and to everyone and then two like as you mature you seek out new challenges and more growth and opportunities to just work on the company you know that's the the term that i think i, I hear a lot is like i want to work more on my business and what they're trying to explain is i want to find my ideal fit and where i get to stay with you know the passion that I get to work enough on the things that make me feel like I'm building and moving things forward, but still recognize like there are things that just have to get done, you know? So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, it's a good framing. Uh, back here. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> of all the things that these owners have to do, you right? You want to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm Nathan Bobbin. I'm the vice president of product for the, the company, so my team develops the, the product roadmap and ultimately delivers the new features to market. So we want to know what the big problems these guys are facing so we can help them to solve it. So of all the jobs they've got to do, what are the what are the top three? What are the most important that you say if you focused on nothing else, if you nailed nothing else, what are the top three things you got to crush? Yeah. Um, I hate saying this because um, it's often the role that they least like to do, which is the marketing and the sales side. Um, because we get into it as passionate about serving, it almost feels foreign to do those things. So we have to, I think, the way I've molded my brain to think about, I now serve through my members and I help more people find the path that they took and the results through my marketing. So I'm looking at it as an extension of my service. And at first I was intimidated by marketing, afraid to do it, not good at it and I didn't want to do it. So I relied heavily on just serve, you know, service and grew through word of mouth. But as the market changes and it gets bigger, like we also have to realize that you can't avoid your weaknesses. So I think the marketing side of just getting comfortable constantly promoting and like capturing assets of case studies and testimonials and you know, harnessing that fear of even the people that are on the fence about starting and just having a good system for sharing that constantly. So I think for the owners, the challenging thing is, is they might understand how to do that um, once or twice, but to get the energy and the power to do that week after week after week and still try and stay in your zone, um, that's really tough to do. So, which is why we need, 
you know, consulting, why we need mentorship so that we can get to a level where the business grows and then we get the right people in place to support that foundation and it keeps growing. So I think that's one of the major areas. Uh, sales, I think is the next of, um, and I would include it in two parts. Uh, the lead follow-up or the communication, nurturing, whatever you want to call it. Um, that area can feel like you're chasing people around that don't really feel motivated or Com, you know, ready to commit. And as coaches, we're like, just give me the person ready. I'm gonna, I know how to, you know, solve the problem. I know how to give them the solution. But if they're not ready and you try to coach and you, you put that energy into someone, it feels like you're, you don't have value anymore. So I think there's that understanding of, you know, sales is um, a process that we have to respect and that people are shopping around and learning about it. And you may not be the right person for them um, until they make that decision to do it. So a lot of getting your hopes up because you know you have the tools and the resources to help them, but if they're not ready, then it's not a good deal. Um, so that's the second part. Um, and then I think lastly, administrative, um, handling all the small detailed items that run a business, um, the processes. Um, that really go into that. So you can see a trend where as a coach um, who started a, a business, <laughs> everything associated with running the business is the least you know, area of, um, of interest, but it's necessary if you're going to you know, take your passion and try and grow it and your vision and, and influence people. So we can say that we adapt and we have to look for new ways of coaching. So Today, I look at a lot of my coaching is through meeting with people like you or on a local level, creating content that I can coach um, and take my lessons and share it on a bigger platform than just one-to-one -one or in a small group. And if I can take it from, say, coaching a group of 15, but I can take that message and scale it to social media and influence a thousand, you could say that I'm having you know, more influence and impact. So it's a great follow-up I'm the king of the two-part question. <laughs> so, um, if those are the three key jobs to do, and I completely don't agree, do you have any golden metrics? Like, how do you know if you're, how do you know when you're winning? Is there anything that you, <coughs> people, okay, just these are the two or three numbers to pay attention to to make sure you're doing those things? Yeah, yeah. Um, I won't tell you, but uh, <laughs> no. <I'm kidding. laughs> uh, the yeah, you want the secret sauce here. Uh, I'm kidding. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that leads uh, fuel new business. So if we're not tracking leads, we don't really have a good sense of whether our content is working, our advertisements are working. So that is, you know, important on the front end. I also think um, how many sales appointments we're getting in front of. So how many people we're meeting with. Um, you know, is, are we in a good understanding of what our prospective clients want and need and are we explaining what we're providing in a really good you know process so I think those are really important on that end and then on the service side um, I look for retention um, so renewal rates you know of the people coming up for renewal how many are we renewing based on a percentage and I think of that as the strength of our service um, how effective are we at um, providing an end result and you know something that they value. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I asked that because I'm, I'm very aware that the folks who get into this business, in the studio market especially, they want to spend their time on the floor helping people yeah. directly, right? And, but they have to spend time on their business, not just in their business. And so our belief is that if we create the right tooling for them, they can be really impactful with less time doing lead gen and the sales and, and the admin stuff that they really don't want to do but they have to. Um, so, so knowing you know, what you look at is the measures for yeah. success is, is for us. You guys are on the right track for sure. Otherwise I wouldn't be with you guys for so long as a affiliate owner who uses your service too. So I'm really happy with what you guys have done and happy to be a part of I don't have all good stuff, by the way. So I, I came here with some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Why is this thing unplugged now? Yeah. Cool. I'm Tia. I'm Tia. Hi. I'm on the sales team. Awesome. Um, 
can you give a little snapshot to like your team, um, how many there are, what you guys are doing, and also like your ideal candidates that you're trying to serve? Yeah, uh, small team, and uh, uh, like most small businesses that grow, um, you find that you need uh, to kind of plug the holes in the business that you're not great at. So one of the first um, areas that I told you before, like sales and marketing were a big opportunity for me. Uh, I tend to be more of like a process systems person. I love management. Um, so that's kind of where I fit within my team. And then I have an administrator as well. So we're a four person team. Uh, and then we kind of operate like a trade school was kind of a, a good way to look at us. Um, my goal is to try and build skill sets that create sustainable businesses, uh, not just quick fix band-aids. Uh, so if we're going to create careers and long-term you know, solutions, it's got to be passing down the skills and the experiences and the lessons that I've had to go through over the last decade uh, in order to you know, continue to build off that. So that's a little bit of uh, where my team is at. And then as far as you know, clients that I love to work with uh, would be full-time. Um, so owner operator that is all in, um, not to say that there's not people out there bridging the gap of in a career that started a, you know, fitness um, program, but I want someone that has made that leap and really trying to put a hundred percent effort and time into making this thing, um, everything that it could be. And, um, so that could be anywhere from, you know, two years in business all the way to some of my clients are 10 years in business trying to elevate it to a whole different level. Um, and people make mistakes too. So uh, the cool thing about coaching people is uh, people's visions are often um, as big as they want to be and then their resources are at where they're at. So I've seen businesses grow too big for the resources and they have to contract and they're now actually much happier. Um, and then I've seen you know, companies just static, but they had all the potential and resources to grow bigger. They just needed that, you know, coaching and that mentorship. So um, in many cases, I'm doing a lot of what I did at the gym member level and getting people to their health goals. But now I look at, you know, my health is now applied to a business health metric, you know. So is it a lot of like one-on-one -on -one mentorship? Um, it's kind of a combination. So again, I run like a school, so some stuff we can scale through technology and um, have, you know, think courses and videos and um, online webinars that we can connect in group format. And then also one of my favorite things to do is uh, host quarterly meetings with my mastery clients. Those are one-on-one -on -one where we really get down to, hey, what's the vision? And then what are the 90-day objectives? And then how are we gonna get there? So it's a little bit of a blend depending on where they're at in our, our membership. Yeah, thanks, good stuff. I'm gonna go back to a higher level because we kept hitting on uh, retention in the boardroom and specifically about uh, retention of not just like the, the gym owner staying in the game, but their employees. Yeah. Um, what does that mean for a fitness business to retain their coaches and and still the, the connection between retaining those employees and the other option, which is like that kind of natural progression of a fitness business owner, right? Where they kind of start in a facility and then grow out of that facility. Yeah, um, this one, it's a little bit harder, uh, but I'll, I'll just kind of bring you into kind of the evolution of a small fitness program and um, I think at first like owner operator we get in there we just hustle and we grow our membership to the opportunity to even hire someone like the moment you make that you've graduated to a whole new level and it's very rewarding to be able to say oh I employ someone or I offer a job and then they freak out about all the paperwork on how to do that but it's a milestone that is really cool to reflect on because now you've gained this opportunity to grow. Like they're literally, um, let's just take it from a coaching standpoint. If I'm coaching all the classes and you come in and you're gonna take 10 of my classes, I get 10 hours back in my day, probably more than that, to now say, what do I do with that? So the platform 
is massive. So I can maybe invest that back into marketing or invest it back into, um, you know, off the floor coaching and, and really tap into, you know, some other elements of service. So that first hire is like a major milestone. And then what we were talking about um, yesterday was the difference between um, part-time roles, which are really, really important in small business because they are a part of that foundation. Um, and they put me in a position where, you know, we can work more on the company, but it gets to a point when the business starts growing and growing and growing, and then we can hire that full-time career and make this someone's, this is how I pay my bills, my mortgage. This is how I start looking at where my resources are to take vacations. And then again, another massive milestone and much harder to get to. Um, but then the root of a lot of this conversation was we were starting to talk about um, you know, employee retention and how important that is to us that our service needs to be really, really good so that membership stays high, revenue stay high, and we can even begin to provide that career. And then once that's in there, I think it becomes like what you guys do really well here. I, I just sat through meetings of exactly what you do and how you do it. And I get to hear individuals talk about their individual role and how passionate they are. So that's the other element of just because you have a team member at this level doesn't mean they're effective, they understand what they're doing, or they're actually contributing to the bottom line. So that's where I think the evolution of where I want to see companies continue to push is let's get better at creating experts in their role and then being able to say, I got it. Like, and it frees up this like stress and this like, you go to bed and you're like, all right, uh, do they really got it? Or like how much of that, that do I have to hang on to in case they don't got it? And what I saw here today is what I would love to replicate across every you know, business is a sense of ownership and responsibility and like confidence that you guys give your higher ups and team members. So. That's plain to you. <laughs> uh, I have lots of questions. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about how you approach the the different stage where the business owner is? Do you start kind of from the discovery with everybody and kind of go back and go through all of that, or do you kind of come in where they are and troubleshoot, or how do you approach that? Yeah, good question. Uh, we try to cast a wide net, so we're we're doing a lot of content creation, advertisement, and. The very first stage um, on the marketing side is I just want people to be aware that we exist and that we're an option. And um, it's great to have you know tons of leads pouring in, but that doesn't mean we're a great fit. So uh, during our um, discovery call, we call it a breakthrough call, and that's really where we're trying to look for the expectation that we're trying to produce in our initial coaching program and that end result, like do they align with the right qualities and characteristics to meet that end result. And that's where I look at it as they're actually enrolling into our ideal client. Um, a lot of people think that you know you cast a wide net or you put your marketing out there and then they come in as an ideal client. I think it happens at the moment of sale where that person is committing to you as a coach to say, I want to become this future version that you've described in your marketing. I agree to do all that, I want to do all that, I will do that, sign me up. And it's that moment where they've transformed into that company or that owner that is working towards that end result. So we look for that very strongly. And if it's not there, and you know, we were talking about this the other day where there are some things that I have personally found that aren't a good fit for me. Like if you're not all in in your, your business and you've got side hustles and distractions, like it's difficult to, to work with that client for me and not to say that people out there aren't working with them, but I've found that my best result and end result, you know, quickness of, of getting that person to that goal, you gotta be all in. And same thing with, I've found like time zones where we've worked with companies across, you know, the world and if they can't get on the coaching calls or be present and uh, those are kind of things that are running into friction points so that's where we have to bring all of that to that uh, you know initial breakthrough call to say hey like here's who we serve best and as soon as we hear those things it's like all right we've got to recommend somewhere else 
So I'm an onboarding coach here. Awesome. Yeah, so some of the things you run into sometimes is somebody like you were just talking about that does, is, does not seem all in. You could do what you can to teach them, but you can't you know, make them drink the water. So do you have any advice for somebody that just doesn't seem all in and they're scattered in so many different ways to kind of rein them in so they can breathe for a second to hear what you have to say? Yeah. Yeah. A um, couple things. It, 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 by the time it gets to you, there are some checkpoints that they've already gone through that we could have done, I think, up the chain, um, even starting at uh, the marketing level um, and, and during that initial phase of making a decision of like who succeeds best in our program. Because at the end of the day, if they join and enroll with you and then they feel like the service isn't great or they're not getting what they want, they're going to feel like, all right, this thing doesn't work. So it's not great to take them on anyways. So that piece or whoever's on that team, we need to be really clear at the enrollment period of does this person fit? within the software that we're running. And I think that's one of your safety nets or gatekeepers that by the time they get to you, you have to have that confidence that that conversation has come up and that they are fully expecting what is gonna come down the chain from you and what hours or time to set these things up that you're asking and then also you know the ease of doing that through the resources you're providing because it could be like you're onboarding if you got I don't know if you guys calculate it in terms of setup time but it's like say it takes eight hours to to get someone from start to finish through onboarding but in the owner's world if you look at that 12 hour day 16 hour day where they can actually sit down and focus you're probably gonna get one to two hours and then that one to two hours could easily get cannibalized member walks in the door gets them out of focus so you could be looking at that person in order to get eight hours of focus time takes them two weeks and you're trying to squeeze it into maybe a week but it's just knowing that what what they're going through and then maybe even a schedule of here's our onboarding process where we recommend doing an hour a day or a half hour a day and having it almost set up like modules where they could just go through and check it off. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. That piece is interesting. Send, send them to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just pa or just pass it on to yeah. <laughs> it's not. It's no longer your problem. <laughs> I was gonna say that piece is interesting because of how the career progression of a lot of fitness business owners. It's either a part-time job. It's something they're passionate about, and they kind of just get into it they still have this other bind, financial bind that they're trying to hang on to yeah. for dear life until they can, you know, grab onto the fitness thing full time. And, it, and it's just not that, like that's a distraction, yeah. but it's also, there's just so many hats to wear in the small business. And like I said before, if it's not their passion and interest to set up tech and software, it's like, how do you get motivated for that? And let alone if you're in another software, the complexity of switching over that on top of being realistic about all right all the contact information the billing might have to get updated so this your <laughs> section of that or piece of that project is actually like 10 steps for that owner and they're like going into it so overwhelmed so yeah it's I feel for you I don't know I don't know exactly the solution but hopefully within that we can create a better onboarding process within looking at their schedule and being realistic of what they can actually consume like because you got to think of it this way too like say they're on the phone with you and they're learning this stuff like that's still time so it has to go into that hour that they have and then they have to go like into the software and try and change the buttons and then actually get it to operate correctly which never happens the first time i feel like you you missed steps and so a anything that we think is easy, I've found, is probably going to take double or triple the amount of time. So that eight hours that maybe <laughs> we have dedicated, it's probably maybe like 24 hours, but it's, it's that scale of just factoring in the human component of they're not familiar with software and they don't want to do it. Um, and I'm speaking as someone that does not enjoy that, but it has to get done, which means it just gets further and further extended. So finding a way to either, how much of that can you guys take on 
and you know that was one of the things that we were talking about earlier of even just factory forge having our own um you know setup process for the clients that we're um providing for and the first question i ask is kind of along this is saying how much of the platform can i already have built out for them where they're just turning buttons on instead of building out the structure of like creating memberships or classes and like is it easier for them to modify something that's already built or easier for them to build it from the ground up? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. That was super helpful, thank you. Yeah. One of the questions we got for Chris. Yeah. Hey, Kendra, also an onboarding. I'm just curious, what's like the story behind how you named your business Factory Forge? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say it's like this deeply meaningful uh, <laughs> thing, so i preface that. But what I feel like, um, I, I have a partner in this, and that's how we originally started the company. And a little bit on that side is like, I really like efficiency. And the name was actually already created as a company. So I kind of came into it, and we reshaped and reformatted an existing company. Um, but the meaning that we came together to create a new vision was we felt like we were forging new companies um, and developing them from a level that uh, they desperately needed help, they wanted help, they wanted to grow, and we were building this with them. We were right there in the fire, just um, you know, improving on what they've created. So that's kind of in my head a vision, even though I've adopted a company from you know a former partner. Yeah. Justin. Yeah, uh, I'm on the marketing team. Cool. Uh, just from uh, like a macro perspective, what would you say are the biggest opportunities and threats facing the industry right now? In the industry? Yeah. yeah. Um, gym industry? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the, the thing that I hear most often, um, technology, uh, if you guys are, you know, familiar with Peloton and wearables and this notion that as we put more things into easy access into our homes or uh, technology to make it a part of our everyday that um, the gym becomes less and less valuable. Um, and I think although that is one angle, I also think it's a real you know, opportunity to showcase the power of coaching and actual connection, like going back to why I started this, like you can't replace human element. And yeah, you can have it across from a screen or you can have an instructor um, pre-recorded or even live, but where is that person connecting with you about your day, your emotions, feedback on injury prevention, or like, are, am I even doing this exercise correctly? Um, that part, I don't think we can ever replace. And the day that we do, I'm be so scared because now we're like robots. Um, so I think that's, I guess, an opportunity in it, within a real threat. Um, and there's just not enough there to really see if it um, is changing because I still see our market growing. And for every person that is, I think, going into that space of like at home, um, you still have the uh, absence of interaction. And I found growing up doing sports, it was like, that's what motivated me, that's what inspired me. And without that, I don't know how long that's sustainable. It's new and it's exciting, but I hope that through even ZP, like we're learning from the tools that they're using to make those things desirable, like metrics or how they're displaying um, you know, workout feedback in real time. Like, I think those things are important. It's why it's drawing people because they're getting a response or a feedback loop of saying, hey, this thing's working for me or I feel like I'm working out really hard and this machine is telling me I am. So there's like that validation. So we have to recognize that technology is there and it's coming. Um, I also think that in the functional space, or more specifically CrossFit, we have to be aware that the moment the barbell goes on the floor, that it limits the class size. So it is realistic to say that a yoga studio fitting 60 people in a room at the same price point as a 
CrossFit affiliate or a functional training facility with equipment cuts down on the amount of people they can safely fit on that floor. So regardless of setup costs and operating costs, the profit per class radically goes down because of the style of training. So we would have to go into that knowing we're giving up profit margin because of the style. So, but that's more of like what charges you up, what style of training. So, yeah, cool. Carolyn. <laughs> oh, okay. um, I'm Carolyn, I'm on the payments team. Not really a team, but sort of. Um, <laughs> so in your experience, what are some of the biggest, if not the biggest financial pain point of these businesses that are just starting up? Whether it's trying to cut down a very specific expense or just something in their overhead that is really a pain point, what have you found to be some of the biggest ones? Yeah, uh, staffing will always, I think, be the biggest. and in that area of just trying to get the get people to care like an owner like i don't know if you guys hear that like it's something we all want for people that we work with to care as much as where the idea or the passion comes from um so that's one piece of it but i also think from like maybe a more tangible line item i think a lot of it needs to go into creating new business um so marketing uh it's difficult for new businesses to invest in marketing, especially word of mouth that, you know, early on you can grow rather quickly through word of mouth, but at a certain point that stops working so successfully. And I think it's important to connect with people that we're trying to impact in our local market. And we have to either spend human capital or spend actual paid advertising or ways to get our brand and message out there. But it's new. Um, for a lot of gyms that start from the ground up and just kind of start it from themselves. Um, so I think that's the biggest opportunity to let go of that fear of saying, if I put this money in, I don't know if it's coming back. So it's really important to have that piece um, with a good strategy and, and feel confident knowing that it deserves to be there as a line item and an expense. And it, it's got to be looked at as a future ROI um, and an investment instead of just I'm putting this out there and it may or may not come back. Like, it's gotta be, this is a pillar of the company, so. I'm so glad that Bell's back. Um, <laughs> so, one o'clock guys, it, do we have any burning questions? I mean, it would be a <laughs> quick answer, it could not be. Something when in <laughs> doubt, <laughs> yes. Cool. Uh, I was wondering, like, what are some like three quick ways that almost any gym could really implement to like immediately see good return or improvement. That sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think three quick wins. Uh, start with service. Uh, I think invest in the client relationship. So pour some form of communication or educational piece in it back into the membership. So it's so easy to hop on video camera and there are clients out there that even though they're in the program they feel off track so it takes maybe taking some of the wins and more successful clients and telling their story on how they got here the same thing of what I'm doing here but without that bridge they will feel lonely trapped eventually feel like they're not fitting in or don't know how to get there so I think if, a, if every coach out there could just think of that one client and remind people where they started that would be a massive retention uh, piece. And then two, I think that um, we've got to do a better job of talking about the results publicly um, to prospects. So sharing that across social platforms and know that we're not trying to sell people, know that we're trying to educate them and bring awareness that, hey, this person uh, did not start here in my program and you can achieve these results. And then the last thing would be have a contact capture form wherever you're sending traffic so that you can actually have someone to contact. Um, that seems so simple, but a lot of um, facilities are sending out great messages, but there's no actual place to fill out a form and get help, so. Thanks. Thank you. Cool. Um, if you guys want to hear more from Chris Thorndike, he just did a really good podcast um, with CrossFit 
Palm Beach, mm -hmm. and it's his uh, buddy Andrew. Yep, one of our customers. So it's two hours long. Really good insight into what's going on in the industry, how you got started, what's going on with Factory Forge. Um, so definitely encourage you guys to listen to that. Um, otherwise, let's uh, give Chris a hand. Thank you.